Okay. Um, now, the last few topics on query processing. So, so far, what have we done? I did a very, very quick high level overview of individual relational algebra operations. Now, all of SQL is translated to these operations, and we get an evaluation plan. So, what does the evaluation plan say? It's going to say, do this operation, then do this operation, then that operation. However, there is, a, you know, if you don't say anything, uh, so let me explain it uh, using this tree. It will be more clear with this. Uh, the simplest way of evaluating a tree like this is to start at the bottom. You start here. Scan department to compute select building equal to Watson and output that result to disk. It can be a large result, so you output it to disk. Okay, now I have finished this part of the tree. I have this result stored. It's called materialized. Materialization means compute it and store it. Now that this is materialized, I can take the join of these two. That's the join. I compute the join and store it. I materialize the join. Then finally, I take that result and there's a project operation, maybe with duplicate elimination. So now I apply uh, that operation and store that result. At each step, I'm computing it and storing it. This is called fully materialized evaluation. But you can see that maybe we shouldn't have done it this way. Maybe we could have saved the cost of storing it and reading it again. For example, uh, take the join result. It is being sent to the projection, which maybe does duplicate elimination. Do we really need to store the result and read it back again? Can we not start the external sort on this result as it comes in? What does the external sort do? I didn't cover it, but basically what it does is, first, it creates what are called runs. It takes some amount of data in an in-memory buffer, sorts it, outputs it, and keeps repeating this. And then it merges the partial sorted runs. If you see what is happening here, the join is generating some tuples. Instead of outputting them as is to disk, I might as well fill a buffer with the join result for the next operation, sort and output it. So what is happening is the join result is being directly sent to the sort instead of being returned to disk and read back again. So I have saved a lot of disk. I have saved the cost of writing it and reading it back. Okay. Is that clear? I can, in many cases, I can save this cost of writing and reading back. Take um, this one. Supposing I choose to do a hash join here. Now, I can do the selection. Maybe I use an index, um, or maybe I do a file scan. Regardless, I'm getting out tuples, which uh, departments in the Watson building. Now, I have chosen to do a hash join. So what I can do is directly send these to the partitioning step of hash join. I won't write them out. I will directly send them to the hash join which will partition and write it. It doesn't write out the result, then read back and partition again. So again, it's being pipelined from the select to the join operation. So this is called pipelining. So pipelining means pass on tuples to the parent operation, even as the operation is being executed. Don't wait for it to finish and then start the next operation. While this is running, start that also and pass tuples directly to it. In contrast, materialization, what does it do? It completely generates this output, only then starts the next operation. So those are the alternatives. So what you end up doing, uh, there's uh, more details on pipelining. Mm, okay, I don't have the figure here. But in general, what you have looks like this. There's a tree. What is a tree? The bottom level are relations, R1, R2. The leaves are relations. 
What are the intermediate nodes here? They're whatever operation. This may be join, this may be intersection, this may be outer join, this may be uh, group by A sum B, and maybe this is again a join. Okay, so this is query evaluation tree when, so I'm, I'm going to pin down which algorithm I'm using. For join, the optimizer will choose that I'm going to do hash join or merge join. Similarly, for intersection, for each of these steps, I have chosen what to do. Okay, this is a query evaluation plan. And the query evaluation plan will also note that this output is to be pipeline or not pipeline. It makes this choice. Uh, so uh, if it's going to be written out, it might say materialize. So that's an annotation here, which says materialize it and then only start the next step. So what we have is in the end a query plan, which is submitted after all these things are noted, how to evaluate it, pipelining, materialization. It is sent to the evaluation engine, which then does the job of executing it. So now, all databases allow you the following. You can give a query and tell the database, tell me how you are going to execute this query. The optimizer is going to look at the query. It's going to look at the statistics. How big are each relation? What indices are present? Using all such information, it does cost estimates and picks a plan which it thinks is the cheapest plan. In reality, it may not be cheapest because it's an estimate. But based on the estimate, it picks a plan, and it tells you that this is the plan I'm going to execute. And in the lab, uh, tomorrow, we are going to s look at these plans and see what they look like. Uh, there's one l last point that I want to make before, about these kinds of plans, which is when you have pipeline evaluation, how exactly do you pass on tuples to the next operator? I just said you pass it on, but how do they coordinate? There are several ways of doing this. One way is to run each operator in a separate process or thread, and then there is inter-process or inter-thread communication. Okay? So when this thread has a result, it passes it on to the operator which is running in the next thread. And you can actually get some parallelism out of this, but practically speaking, what people have found is that when you have any such system, you have two different threads which are accessing a common queue. This thing generates, that's a consumer, producer, consumer. You, if, if you taught an OS course, or at an OS course, you know about producer, consumer. You need synchronization, a semaphore. If you try to get and release a semaphore per tuple, you're dead. That overhead will kill everything else. Okay, so what they have found is it's much cheaper to not run it in separate processes, but to run it in a single process. So now how do you coordinate generation of tuples across different uh, operators which are all in a pipeline? And the answer is that you have actually two choices. We are going to look at just the pipeline, so just one pipe, forget materialization. There are say three operators which are in pipeline. Output of one is going to the next, to the next, and so on. So let's look at this situation. So there are two ways of executing a pipeline, demand-driven and producer-driven. So what do we mean by demand-driven? Demand-driven starts at the top, the top of the pipeline, and that operator says, tells its children, give me an input. That child, in turn, may have to go to each child and say, give me an input. And that child may be a relation scan, it fetches the next uh, record from the relation, passes it up. This operator may be a select, it checks the condition on the record. If the condition succeeds, what happens? It passes it up. If not, what does it do? It again goes back to the side and says, give me the next record. Till it finds a record that satisfies the selection and passes it up. That's an easy case. What if it's a join? Merge join, okay? The parent of the merge join says, give me a record. 
the merge join has to find a matching pair and output that. And then when it asks again, it should find the next matching pair and return it. So it turns out all the algorithms which we have seen can be modified a little bit to do the following. Instead of outputting all the records at once, they can leave off in the middle, and when they're called again, they will restart from where they left off and return the next record. Okay. So uh, this is called, uh, yeah, it's here. So what, what happens is an operator returns a tuple, and it's going to be called again and returns the next tuple. In between these two calls, the operation has to maintain a state. What is the state? What did it last do? What was the state? So that next time it can give the next tuple. Okay? So that's a key thing in pipeline. And uh, so this is for the demand-driven or lazy evaluation. And this is what most databases implement. PostgreSQL. Uh, Oracle, everybody does this. Okay. So there is an alternative which is called producer-driven or eager pipelining, where the pipelining is not driven from the top. It's driven from the bottom. This operator is generating a tuple. It has generated a tuple. It pushes it to its parent, says, here, take this tuple. And then that parent has got a tuple. Now it says, OK, I have a tuple. I'll see if I can generate an output tuple and push it to my parent, and so forth. And then, of course, this one again gets a chance. It generates more tuples. So that is uh, producer-driven or push or eager pipelining. So this is also used, but it's used more in parallel processing. When you have one operator running on one machine, another operator on another machine, then producer-driven is often very useful. But on a single machine, uh, pull is typically what is used. So coming back, the operator has to maintain state and then return the next tuple. Now, those of you who know Java know there's a notion of iterator in Java. What is an iterator? You can call next on it. It gives the next object. It's an object. Anytime you call next on it, it gives you the next result. Same concept. These operators now are iterators. The operator, you can call next on the operator. It gives the next result. Because they support a few more operations, such as reset, and so that you can again start from the beginning, and so forth. So what is the iterator model for file scan? Okay. So when you open, so the, sorry, uh, I forgot to mention this. In the iterator model, there are three basic calls. There's open to initialize, next, which is called repeatedly to get next, next tuple, and then close to shut down. So three basic operations. So every single operation, uh, maybe hash join, merge join, index nested loop join, whatever it is, every one of these in any da standard database system is written with three functions, and maybe more. Some extra ones are there. But these three are minimum. So for example, file scan. What is the open? It opens the file. What do you mean by file scan? I mean, I want to scan all the records in a file. So when it opens, it actually physically opens the file. This is a operating system level file open. What is the next function for that? It reads the next record from the file and returns it. What is the state? Where in the file it is. So if you think about it, in, when you open a file in the OS and say read, 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 the OS is tracking where it was in the file. When you say read uh, 10 bytes, it's reading the next 10 bytes. It is an iterator. A file read is an iterator in that sense. It is remembering where it was in the file, and when you say read, it returns the next one. So that's the same here. For merge join, on the other hand, what would open do? You know, if the relations were not sorted, maybe it will actually sort at that point. The open might actually go do a sort. Well, in reality, the query optimizer will actually create a sort operator. The merge operator doesn't do sort. There is a sort operator in the plan which gives the sorted input to the merge operator. So this won't actually happen in a realistic plan. But if you had a merge operator which also did sorting, yes, it would do the sorting at that point. And then what is the state? It's a pointer to those two relations. On next, what do you do? You move those pointers, 
and find the next record, return it. And it has to remember where the records are. It also has to remember whether it has to rewind the second one in case of duplicates. The second relation may have five occurrences of D. The first one may have three occurrences of D. So the first time DD match, you output it. The next time this one moves, the second D matches, you output it. Third D, fourth D, fifth D. After the fifth D, you find the next one is E, but there are more Ds on this side. You have to rewind that to the first D and move this to the second D. Okay? So all this is part of the state of the merge operation. It has to remember what it last did to know what to do next. Whether to use a demand-driven approach or producer-driven approach, it will depend on what two consecutive operators are there in a tree. Uh, suppose there is a join and mm -hmm. then parent operator is project operator. Project yeah. operator will work fast compared to join. And if it is demand driven, project operator will demand, but join will might take time to give the output. Yeah. So if, so first of all, uh, if you run these in different processes, this matters. Then one process is idle while the other is working. And that's the reason typically it's not run in different, pro I mean, there are many reasons for not running it in different process. One was the semaphore overhead. The second is this problem. Uh, generally, one will be the bottleneck, all the rest will be sitting idle. So it's a bad way of doing parallelization. What actually happens is both of them run in the same process. Therefore, there's no idle. This is called, it calls the child. So the process is not, uh, processor is not sitting idle. It is doing work continuously. Thank and you. Uh, whether you use uh, pull or push, it doesn't matter from the viewpoint of keeping the processor busy. But practically, most databases use the pull model for multiple reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that some, there are many cases where after fetching a few tuples, uh, the parent operator may stop. If you have an exist subquery, it'll fetch one tuple and stop. And there's no point computing a lot of results. Uh, similarly, when you're outputting things to the user, uh, there may be a limit, 10. So you only want to generate 10, after that you stop. So there are many reasons why the pull model is currently favored. There are people who are saying that maybe you should change, but as of now, this is popular. Using different processes will be much more yeah, faster. Using multiple processes might be faster if it is a multi-processor system, but there's a trade-off between synchronization and um, this thing. So typically what is done is in parallel processing, uh, you divide up the plan in a different way. What you do is you partition the data and then on each partition you run a plan. That plan may do pipelining, it may do demand driven pipelining, but it, it will not coordinate with the others. The killer is coordination. So in parallel query processing, what is typically done is you have multiple stages. In each stage, you first partition the data in some way, then run locally on each partition. The partitions don't talk with each other. Each is a single process, running on a single thread maybe even, and that finishes. Then you may repartition the data and again run in parallel. Uh, that has proven more successful than one guy generating it, passing it on to the next guy. And the reason is what I said. Uh, the speeds may be different, and then things are sitting idle. So you don't want this to happen. Everything, everybody should be busy. This happens in a human pipeline, right? Yeah. If you go for lunch now, there's a pipeline of people putting food. The pipeline speed is determined by the slowest guy. The other guy is sitting idle waiting for customers. Uh, but there's a physical reason why parallel processing is difficult here. Um, but if you can avoid uh, pipelining, it's actually uh, for parallel processing. Pipelining is used to avoid writing to disk, but it's not used to parallelize. In slide number 12.25, if S contain same value of D, in yeah. that case, what will happen? Yeah, that's what I was trying to explain in the air. <laughs> so Nini, you have to match every D here with every D there. So effectively, uh, if you know where the first D is and the last D is in both of these, you'll do a nested loops. For each D here, for each D there. Can you both have D and. Hmm? Can you repeat the question? Repetition of D in PS. Uh, in a S, yeah, here. that's what I'm saying. You can have multiple Ds in S, multiple Ds in R. Yeah. All of them have to be matched. 
all the pairs match all the dc here match all the then duplicacy match. will be huh? so repetition is allowed no who said that the join attribute is unique it can have duplicates and you have to generate all that sir in case of distributor file system how do you maintain that index tree? I mean, it is centrally located or it is scattered across the uh, different uh, nodes? For big table like distributed right, indices. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, so how do you split an index across multiple machines? Right. So the way it's done in big table is there is a top level thing, right, which is a tablex. Right. So what effectively happens is uh, there is an index which is not a B plus tree index which indexes the tablet. So let, let me draw it, it will be more clear. Instead of having one huge index on the whole thing, uh, big table actually does the following. This is one tablet. Tablet one, two, three, so forth. Now the data is range partitioned across tablets. What do I mean by that? Let's say the first tablet has things from A, A to AP, uh, okay? And then the next one is from just above AP to, um, let's say, BZ, whatever, right. and so forth, OK? So uh, now, given a key, by using this, so this thing, this is not a B plus tree. It's the, uh, it could be an array or some other in-memory data structure. This is kept in memory. So given a value, I can find out which tablet it maps to. I need only two values, right? The beginning and the end per tablet. Two values per tablet, and then a pointer to the tablet. I need to know which tablet it is. So this is a, uh, essentially this is an in-memory, uh, you can think of it as an index or map or call it what you will. This is stored on one machine in the master. Uh, you can replicate it and so on, actually. Uh, but I won't get into detail. For simplicity, let's assume this is there everywhere or somewhere. So now, if I want to do a lookup, first I will look up the value to see which tablet. If it's a range, it may be multiple tablets. Then I go to the tablets. Here I have a B plus tree. So this is big. The tablet is not small. It's like a few hundred megabytes, which could be several million entries. So here I have a tree, and I will look it up in the tree. So I'm, I may search down and find a thing in the B plus tree. Or if it's a range scan, I may end up scanning everything here, everything here, and up to somewhere here. A range scan can go across multiple tablets. So that way we identify in which node that particular tablet is gets available. Uh, OK, that's the other part. Which, where is the tablet residing? Right. That in is which, one more, in, in which I didn't show it present. here. And, which uh, and the reason that matters is a machine may die. So then the tablet has to be handled by another machine. So at any point, I want to know which machine is taking care of the tablet. What if the machine taking care of the tablet dies? Well, the tablet data is on the file system. So another machine can take over and do some recovery for the tablet and then start serving that tablet. So th that's part of the fault tolerance of big table. But at the index level, Conceptually, there are many small indices, and then an in-memory thing which tells you which index to go to. Each of these is on one machine. So I need to know which tablet and where that tablet is. So there's another map, uh, tablet to machine mapping is also there. So all of this uh, system takes care of. So when you have a lookup request, it goes through this, then through this and goes to that machine. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions? And we are using same hash function. Yeah. So uh, suppose I am taking the modulus function, so uh, size will be the same for uh, both hash tables. So how actually that can be in mind? No, no. So the question is, I am taking one large relation, one small relation, same hash function. Won't the size be the same? No, the answer is, the number of partitions is the same. Yes. If I have five partitions here, five partitions there. But the question is, how many records fall in that partition? If I take a particular partition, let's say R had a million rows, S had uh, 20,000 rows. And now I'm dividing it into five partitions. R, one million tuples divided into five is 200,000. S, 
20,000 divided into five partitions is 4,000. So obviously the sizes of the partition vary. And so I prefer to build on S and probe using R. R need not fit in memory. Only S partitions need to fit on memory. So when I'm probing on R, what am I doing? I'm taking an R tuple, looking up the index, finding matches, outputting them, throw away the R tuple, move on to the next R tuple. So I'm just scanning that R partition. There is no requirement that R fit in memory. So we will not break uh, S, we will only break the R. We have to partition both R and S. We can't get away partitioning only one. Well, there are some things which will partition only S, but then they have to scan R multiple times. Uh, so that is a trade-off. If the number of partitions of S is very small, say two partitions, people have found it useful to simply scan R twice, rather than read it once, partition, then read again. Uh, but those are some special cases. That's where that, uh, you know, 200-page uh, article on query processing comes. Take all these special cases and optimize them. There are a lot of details, but we won't get into that. Okay, I think people are hungry. I'll stop here.